Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. On today's episode, I have the pleasure of having lead singer, guitarist, and songwriter of the Smashing Pumpkins, Billy Corgan, as my guest. Billy's been at the forefront of the music scene since Smashing Pumpkins released their first record, Gish, in 1991. His distinct voice and guitar playing, along with his often provocative lyrics, have made Smashing Pumpkins one of the most important bands of their generation. In this interview, we'll talk about Billy's background, how he writes songs. We'll listen to some Smashing Pumpkin songs and see Billy react to them. But before that, if you're new to the channel or you've been watching and haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button now. Here's my interview. Billy, welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, to sit here with you. So I've been a Smashing Pumpkins fan since Gish came out, 1991. I've gone through a few different periods of going back and listening to your early records. The thing I noticed with Gish, for example, is that even today, there's nothing that sounds dated about it. It sounds so modern. Why do you think that is? No idea. Because at the time, when it came out in 1991, all the reviews were like throwback, psych, you know, hippie crap, <laughs> jam band, Grateful Dead. Go what, read the What re record were they listening to? I don't to? know. I think it was so not what people thought music would be that they just, they grasp for comparisons. I mean, there there's reviews that were like, they sound like a cross between R.E.M., The Black Crows, and Jimi Hendrix or something. It was like, it would be like, like it didn't even make sense. Like the DNA splices they would put together to try to describe our music was so off. I, I think part of it is, is that we didn't know what we were doing. So what we did do was an invented language wholly onto ourselves. And it made sense to us. And it shocked us when people reacted not so much negatively we were used to that it was like they didn't understand what we were doing we we're like it's just kind of rock and roll like it sounds like blue cheer or something you know what i mean like we didn't think we were so far off the grid that we were doing something say as strange or different as primus or something you know where you would go oh that's really different and less is playing so differently or even flea flea's approach to like funk bass but the application in the peppers we didn't right. feel we were that different so when people reacted to us almost as if we were heretics or something. It was sort of strange to us. And there was also the whole, whole other thing of like playing solos, which was verboten in alternative circles at the time. You weren't supposed to play solos. And if you even think of like Kurt on Nirvana, he would play like ironic solos. You were, he, they weren't real guitar tone solos. But, but we they like, always had solos. All This is the thing that, that bands of that time period, people would say later on, oh, there were no solos in the 90s. Like, wait a minute, like every band in the early yeah, 90s. Yeah, like Kim, Kim Thayil would play solo, but, but they, weren't, they weren't solos played by people who were necessarily trying to play like Richie Blackmore. I was right. trying to play you like were, Richie Blackmore. Exactly. So I, and I, my father was a guitar player, so I came from that root of like, if you're gonna play a solo, you better play a good solo. Like it was, there was a pressure on me from that. As far as the modernity question, I couldn't tell you. Um, obviously, a lot of it has to do with Butch's, Butch Vig's uh, recording. This is clear and crisp and very direct, and I think that is that holds up well. Did Butch have anything to to do with? Uh, did did he say to you, hey, "This is cool"? Did you just let you guys do your thing, and he captured it? Pretty much. We had done demos starting in '89 in a in a, like a home project studio in Chicago with a guy named Mark Inafo. and if you listen to those demos from '89, they basically sound like Gish before Gish. So I'd already worked out the sound of the band. Butch just took it to a whole nother level. And then he was insistent on things that Butch would be insistent on. Tuning, timing. You know, I remember one time I was singing a vocal and he was like, you're out of tune. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I knew what he meant in terms of like, if you're tuning guitar, like it's, but it, he was like, oh, you're sharp. And I was like, sharp against what? I couldn't even contextually understand what he was saying. So I think we were talented people who developed our own musical language and I had enough of a production sense to put the band together in a way that was tidy and efficient, which took that and made it way better than it would have been if we just did it on our own. But there's a direct line from what we, what we had done on our own and what Butch did. And Butch was a great facilitator in that, in that he recognized what was strong about the band and he amplified that, particularly built around Jimmy's drumming. 
One of the things that separates you from a lot of people is that you write great up-tempo rock songs. And I think that's one of the hardest things to do. Cherub Rock, for example, up-tempo. The first two songs on Gish are up-tempo songs. Sure, my father being a guitar player, my father always played in R&B bands. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that growing up in Chicago and listening to Curtis Mayfield and a lot of great um, uh, African-American music, I think that that's sort of an underappreciated or misunderstood thing about us is that there's a lot more rhythmic energy in our music. And that's what drives us more than, say, trying to play up-tempo rock. We're playing more up-tempo rhythmic music that comes across as rock. So I think that's probably got more to do with it. It's like, uh, you know, I used to say, shake your ass. But, you know, like if you think of a song like Shiva or Chair Rock, there's a sort of inherent kind of thing in there that's more rhythmic. Um, that's what strikes me about that. I think we're more, uh, and I'm speaking for Jimmy Chamberlain too, I think we're more tonal. Uh huh. Like, uh, people would always say, like, your music's depressing or something. <laughs> we, we, we don't think of our music as depressing. We understand why people think of it, but it, it's the tone, it's, it's a tone, right? Uh, Coltrane playing, I can never think, I can never say that is. Naima. See, thank you. You read my mind, literally. <laughs> but is that depressing music? You know, I mean, it's beautiful, it's, it's stately, music. and it's, it expresses the breath of love and, and, and life. It's a life experience thing. Mm -hmm. you know, so we would think of it more in terms of violence or something. Like There's a certain violence in the way that we play. So a song like Shiva would have a particular type of violence that would be more um, based on taking LSD and listening to Ravi Shankar and like mixing it with Black Sabbath or something, like Faster with Sabbath. A song like Chair Rock, that would be more like, that's basically us doing Rush or something. Right. Like basically, the beginning of Chair Rock is, is ripped off from By Tor and the Snow Dog by Rush. It's a straight rip off of Rush. But the, the backbeat rhythm, to me, we see that, see that we, when you see Chair Rock being up tempo, we think that we see that as a halftime song. So to us, this is the well, rhythm. You do mix these tempos, like on Tonight Tonight, for example. Mm -hmm. In the verses is a mid-tempo song, but mm -hmm. because of Jimmy's drum part, yeah, uh, with the with the roll, you know, the rolling snare, it's but we saw it that begins the, like an up-tempo song. But we saw that as the Who. If you listen to the backing track of Tonight Tonight without the strings, it's just like the Who. We're just basically doing a poor imitation of the Who. <laughs> it's like very busy drumming filtered through you though in your taste right sure but that's what i mean about tone like mm -hmm. the way we talk internally is about like like we'll say something about sabbath but we're not trying to sound like black sabbath it's the way black sabbath makes us feel and whether we're reapplying that sort of dynamic in a way that gives us the same feeling but we're able to put our own spin on it and i think that's something that's always confused people about us is because we're not interested in mimicry we're interested in assimilating tone and then sort of regurgitating in a way that seems novel. You're an incredibly great melody writer, which is why you're, it's, you've had a successful career. Tell me about your process of writing melodies. How do you think of melodies? Do you do a wordless vocal with a guitar? Do you sit down with an acoustic, with an electric? What do you, like, how do you write your melodies? Um, in the beginning, I, I could not hear the melody in my head it was very frustrating because I was a guitar player through and through. I was not a singer. Duh. When I would first write songs, I would go to sing something and it would be totally the wrong thing. And I would be like, well, this ain't gonna work. So I would sit there with the guitar and play the chord and think, okay, that note sounds interesting. So then I would sing that note. And somewhere along the way, I developed the ability to hear the melody in my head to where I would play the chord. And then, and it's, I don't know, it's like a computer or something. The melodies just come out. It's Blah, blah, I call it blah, blah, blah. I'll just sit and play and it'll be la, 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 blah, 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 blah. Um, A wordless vocal. Yes, almost that, almost always. And then would you make a demo of that and listen to it in I your just car? Did, I just and, did one this morning. Okay. I just and did you one. listen to it over, and then how long does it take for you to start coming up with lyrics? Will you have a couple words out of that? Uh, you know, you, you'll have a phrase like, you know, please don't leave me, you know, whatever. <laughs> You know, and sometimes those are bad because you can't get rid of them later. Right. You know, you get stuck with the please don't leave me lyric. Um, I try to write lyrics towards the very end when I have the tone mm -hmm. of the piece in front of me and then the vocal is sort of matching. 
almost all the famous songs that people would point to, the lyrics were written way late in the process. When you're working on these and you know that it's a song that, that is going to be a single, or is there any one in particular that took longer to finish because you didn't have a lyric, a finished lyric? No, lyrics have never been a problem. I think writing good lyrics are a problem, but writing lyrics has always been easy for me. I think it's always the delineating point between like bad high school poetry and having something <laughs> fresh to say. And with us, because the music's very emotional. That's why I think tone is so important, because you could say something like, please don't leave me, or I love you. In the right moment, it can be like a shot through the heart. Yeah. In the wrong moment, it's excruciatingly you know, poor form. So I think it has a lot to do, because it's, it's ultimately the marriage of melody, the rhythm of the melody, the tone that you're singing in, the key, and then the version of the band. And with this band, there's so many different versions of songs, it sort of morphs. It's kind of like a moving target. It depends on what day you're, um, because we learned to, to work in a deconstructive way because of working with Flood, who'd worked with Eno. So we're deconstructors more so than constructors. So we'll put something together, then rip it apart and put it back together and rip it apart. So there's a melange of things that happen in there. So it was probably more akin to like Bowie's process or something where you're kind of constantly reflecting until you find something that feels just slightly different. Because to me in the beginning, it always sounds like everything else, including ourselves, which is excruciating in its own way. It's like, been there, done that. Like, how do we say anything new, especially after 34 or five years? Do you find that certain types of, so if, like I look at a particular song off Gish, the song Daydream, which is the last track mm -hmm. on there, and the dissonant chords that you use mm -hmm. in there, that do you find that certain guitar things that you come up with suggest not only the melody, but melancholy. And this is maybe why people say you're depressing. Mm. What they mean is melancholy. And this is, to me, the feeling that I get when I listen to a lot of your music mm. is what, what makes it so beautiful. Mm. And do you think that these do guitar parts or chords or things like that, that you come up with riffs uh, that suggest these kind of um, emotions? Good question. I mean, our joke is, you know, if you want to know the secrets, it's all about the sevenths and the ninths. Right. <laughs> right. You know, play your standard C, you take your finger off, okay, now you have a C7. There's that little bit of Spanish sorrow in there. Mm -hmm. Or play a same C chord, but add the ninth over the top on the D, and now you sound a little bit more shoegaze. It's kind of hopeful-ish, a mm -hmm. little bit of sort of up in the chord. Like you bring up Daydream, you know, that was influenced by my Bloody Valentine, and Kevin Shields did such a wonderful job of playing these kinds of sevenths and ninth chords that would make you feel something, but it was kind of an amorphous feeling. It wasn't, it's hard to pin down. It's like um, sunshine on a rainy day or something, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a mixed set of emotions. And I think um, pe people used to ask me more about that in the beginning when they were interested in my process. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're a... Uh, you're, you're picking it up way later. It's because like back in the day, I mean, people would ask me all the time about these things and at some point they just stopped asking. I used to say that life is very complicated and I'm trying to f express something that expresses the complication. When you talk about shoegaze, this influence, the Loveless record, the, mm. the uh, Kevin Shields and My Bloody Valentine and Alan Mulder, and um, I was thinking of this record yesterday, the Curve Doppelganger record uh, that Flood did and um, uh, that period of time, this kind of clouds of distortion, how would you define shoegaze and how is that part of, because I always thought of Smashing Pumpkins as alternative rock, metal, shoegaze, it's all of these things kind of combined mm -hmm. through your personal taste. Sure. Um, well, let's start with My Bloody Valentine. I found them on college radio, somehow got their first album went to see them play the first time, I think they were in Chicago in front of 100 people. So I was very early on on what Kevin was doing, but then it was still very noisy. So, but when Loveless came out, and it was the EP that came out first, yeah. I was actually in the studio working with Butch and we sat there and we put it on and we were like, what is he doing? We could, we like, then we would hear rumors that they were melting the tape and all this <laughs> crazy shit. Um, the beautiful thing of it is because of that is how we end up working with Alan Mulder because we thought, well, let's get the guy who mixed this stuff yeah. because 
this is perfect. And Alan is just such a talent. It's still one of the top mixers in the world. So it was no um, accident that Alan was at the forefront of something fresh and new. Made great records with Curve, uh, Swerve, Swerve Driver. Driver. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Um, so we were blessed by Alan's uh, personality, humor, and, and, and ability. And he brought some of that. But then, of course, he told us all the behind-the-scenes stuff. And he was like, he literally whacked over the SPX-90. And he goes, here's the program. Punched it in and stored it for me. <laughs> so by 93, I had the Kevin secret. You know what I mean? And, of course, we became friends with uh, the Valentines and would hang out with them often. And we'd go over to the house that they had bought. And Kevin would play us unreleased stuff. And so... We felt a very personal connection, I certainly did, to Kevin as a person. And one of the backstories that Kevin told me that people don't realize about My Bloody Valentine is that Kevin um, spent a lot of time in his teens in America. Mm -hmm. So he was very influenced by American oh, rock. I did not know that. So he brought American rock influences into UK shoegaze. And so I think consciously or unconsciously, I identified that there was something rock happening um, and that was very exciting to me because I would listen to a lot of bands that I really liked, um, Chameleons UK, Slow Dive, so many great bands out of the UK, um, Bauhaus. I mean, you, I mean, I sit here for ten minutes and talk about Echo and the Bunny Men. Very influential, but you didn't necessarily get the rock. The rock that, power. that, that My Bloody Valentine and Swerve Driver had. or Sisters of Mercy, so, even right. Uh, Wayne in particular, like brought a rock so I I was I was always looking starting as early as 85 I was looking for the rock thing in UK music yeah so Kevin was one of those people like kind of gave me the keys to it, it was like oh I can kind of see how that would work like playing these big chords like with sevenths and ninths but like blasting the shit out of them through marshals and then James and I would play whether it would be different octaves and then we started bending and you would get this like LSD trip feel like right rear. So we kind of took our own version of the rrrr, but we put it in our left hand, where Kevin used the whammy bar and the reverb to kind of create the cloud. We started doing it physically, and then Jimmy being such a propulsive drummer, he would like lean into the rrrr, so like chair rock. Right. So um, yeah, it was very exciting. Um, it's interesting that you say cloud, because I always think of this as a cloud of distortion, a beautiful cloud dissonant cloud or something and that that's the uh that's the shoegaze that's what makes it that and let me let me give you one little thing that that alan told me um because of course i picked his brain about everything that kevin would do in in the studio tell me what a day is like in the studio with kevin he said he would spend seven or eight hours getting the guitar sound okay and literally sit there at the eq board and go like sweep tone he said there would even be a dog in the studio and he would look for the the things that would make the dog go like this <laughs> right and then he said he would spend seven or eight hours getting the sound, mm -hmm. the sound, and then one take. That would be it. So you worked with Butch, then you worked with Alan and Flood, and tell me the difference between them as producers and what they bring as producers, engineers, and their demeanors, what they brought to the different records. Sure. Well, let's start, it's easier to do it by category. Yeah. Engineers. Yep. Three ace producer engineers. You want to talk about being blessed by talented people. Yes. I mean, think about the people I work with. Butch, Flood, Alan Mulder. I mean, yeah. you're talking about an assassin's crew of engineers. Yeah. Great producers. Now, mm -hmm. producing mind. Butch, very American. Let's get it perfect. Let's get it in tune. Let's keep it real clear and tidy and punchy. Butch like a good punch. Butch being a drummer. Loved a great kick drum sound. I certainly vibed off of Jimmy. So built everything in the pumpkins around the drums. Kind of left the guitar department to me. Kind of like, I don't understand what the fuck you're doing over there. But you kind of do your thing. But I'm very focused on rhythm and propulsion. Flood, very much a deconstructionist because he came out of that Eno camp. Yep. Um, I think Flood's first session ever as a T-boy in, in England was with Joy Division. So Martin Hannett, you know... Uh, geniuses of, of people with vision of how to apply sound and aesthetic into a production style. So you're inheriting this wealth of information, unforgettable fire, violator, you know, right. totally different tonal experiences. And then being in apply flood, Butch was very attracted, let's call it the shiny chrome Siamese dream, obviously, this kind of beautiful, fuzzy, beautiful dream. Flood was like, 
I'm into the darkness. <laughs> Give me the down-tuned, <laughs> scary pumpkins. And we were like, okay. Nobody ever wants that from us. We like that, but nobody likes us. So we went off the cliff with that. Alan having bridged both eras. Alan's one of those rare people where somehow he takes a rock song and makes it sound better than you think it sounds when you're rough mixing it. Because usually you do it and oh, it sounds great and then the mixer somehow messes something up. The guitars are too bright or something. Somehow Alan, it's always better, more rock, mm -hmm. which is very rare for a UK guy. Right. I mean, I think it's very notable that when Zeppelin reunited and did the, the O2 concert, it was Alan that did the mix on that. I think that says a lot that somebody like Alan can can wrap his arms around that legacy and and still bring the rock, but it's a very, it's a sort of certain way of doing it. It's not it's not the brutal slam it through the compressor wall. It's a sort of finesse thing. So anybody who would know, go listen to those Swerve Driver records, which yes. Alan produced and mixed. There's such beautiful detail, yes. but they rock. They rock. So it's this beautiful thing of like you can hear shit, and it's so cool what they're doing, but you still like you still want to crank it up. It does, you don't feel like. Uh, uh, I don't know. It, it, it's an American versus UK thing, but a lot of times the UK music, it just doesn't rock. That would be the pumpkin's way of putting it. It just doesn't have the... You know, I interviewed Adam Franklin from Swerve Driver, mm. and I asked him, I said, how did you meet Alan Mulder? He said, I met him at a bar. Sounds and he's right. like, oh, I, I produce records. I should produce you guys. Or something. like, this is... I said, come on, that's not true. He said, no, that that's actually yeah. how... But how Alan's the sweetest guy, so if you know Alan, it makes sense. Um, I've spent thousands of hours with these guys. So it's hard to say, here's Alan Mulder, here's Flood, here's Butch in a, in a little beautiful box. There's such talented people. It's hard to express when you're in there with them. It could be a joke, it could be an insight, it could be an understanding of a musical languaging thing. It could be knowing what piece of gear to reach for. It's such a beautiful experience because everything curates into the better result at the end of the day. And you know, you're a musician, you have an ego, and you think like, oh, I wrote this song, it's my thing. And years later, when you really sit back, you go, oh man, they really did me a favor. Because you'll hear rough mixes or demos, and you think, oh man. You know, it's it's one thing to say, you know, I wrote this classic. It wouldn't have happened without those guys. Absolutely, we're very humble on that now. We understand that those guys had so much to do with what we did. Did you know at the time when you, really, like, when you did Siamese Dream, did you know the songs that were gonna be the big hits? Did you have an inkling of that, that Disarm would be a big song? Or tell me about that. When you finish a record, or are you just over it when it's done? Well, that's complicated because the process of making the record was torturous. And that, that particular one, right? Well, because we had signed to Virgin. They put us out on Caroline first. We had the biggest independent album of all time. Yeah. Gish. Yep. But we're basically kind of a psych jam band right <laughs> they wanted to re-release the record on virgin and i fought that so i basically stuck my foot and said let me make a record that would be more apt to the atmosphere that exists now which is let's call it the post nirvana pearl jam era where everything's on mtv and gish was not made of singles you know rhinoceros was five minutes long and, yeah um shiva had like this long art breakdown in the, in the middle so we knew we had to write a pop record, but we weren't a pop band. So we did our best effort to write songs that we thought would maybe work in that atmosphere. Disarm, it wasn't like there was a song like Disarm on the radio. No. There wasn't a song like Chair Brock on the radio. No. Today was maybe kind of sort of like other stuff, but it wasn't like, um, you wouldn't say today was like, smells like teen spirit. No, nothing like it. We felt outside pressure to make a grunge record, and our reaction was to go, we were, we're gonna, not gonna make a grunge record. We're gonna make a Smashing Pumpkins record, whatever the hell that meant. So we went to the nines to figure out a language that was wholly our own, the shoegaze influences, whether it was Deep Purple or Sabbath, or we went, I mean, we got a ton of shit in reviews when Siamese Dream came out because because it was overproduced. <laughs> whatever that means. Well, in 1993 terms, it meant we were trying too hard. And it's I, it's and ludicrous when you look well, back you look at it. Now, yes. I mean, with everybody auto-tuned to shit. Right. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we were, we were overproduced. So, of course, I doubled down in interviews and said, no, we were just trying to do Boston and Queen. 
which, by the way, is not something you're supposed to say in alternative circles in 1993. <laughs> I, I remember when you said that, and I love that. That was so, it was so honest and so. Uh, and it was true. And true, yeah. Because I was like, if I'm gonna make a record, I'm going out like Tom Schultz. I'm not going out like <laughs> Kurt, you know what I mean? I'm going out like Tom Schultz. <laughs> that was, in my mind, that made sense to me. Right. But we took a lot of junk for that because somehow layering guitars was something you weren't supposed to do or using strings. And we were criticized for using strings. Well, you used strings on, the, on, on Daydream, on the first record, so. Yeah, but the way we used strings on Disarm, that was, a, that was too something. And I was like, it's Glenn Campbell. It's, it's you know, uh, John Paul Jones on the Mellotron, on the Zeppa. I mean, what's the difference? It's tonight, tonight. Did you do the string arrangement on that? I did mostly. Um, Flood knew a woman who, whose name escapes me, I apologize for that, um, who was a, noted who'd worked with Nick Cave and a bunch of people um, in the UK scene. So she flew over to write the, because it was gonna be a 30 piece orchestra. Did you do that with the Chicago Symphony with the with the? No, they actually section? flew in uh, New York people. It was it was a heavy hitters group that they, their people flew in from New York, there were Chicago people. They put together like a real deal. It's it's a great string arrangement. It's hard to but write let me string take, arrangements but let me take you, for rock Let me songs. take you back. Okay. Um, we were working in a, a place in Chicago called CRC, which I think is closed now, but um, there was like, you know, the typical studio where there's the desk and the chairs, and then in the front of the board was like this little pit. So we set up like a little workstation area, early version of Pro Tools. And for four days, uh, I and this woman who had a, you know, a, a studious background, sat there and wrestled over the string arrangement. and the, and the and the common conversation was I would tell her what I wanted or I would play it on the keyboard and she would say, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so this went on for four days. So um, to her credit, she was able to add things that lent an air of sophistication and, and polyphony and some counter movement. Um, but yeah, probably 90% of it's me because if you listen from a, I listen to classical music, if you listen, it's not, it's like somebody pretending to do classical music and she at least sawed some of the edges off it. Um, the great compliment that I got that day, you know, bringing the session players and, you know, you got three hours and the clock's running and the union and all that stuff. And people were making mistakes and you start thinking, are they making mistakes on purpose and all that. If anybody knows those legends about, oops, I, we went over time, you gotta pay us for another hour. So we were sweating all that, it was very expensive. One of the guys was like the lead violin or the lead cello pulled me aside and said, did you write this? I said, yeah, mostly. He goes, it's like Mahler, it's cool. Nice compliment. Nice. So there's a, so the tone poem, is, if anybody knows Mahler, it's not that I was going for Mahler, but I was going for this kind of more of a tone poem. When you use strings like that mm. in, a, in a tune, especially that has this high energy drum part, it's hard to get strings to play where they're not dragging. Was there, was there this an issue? Were you, were you thinking about this? Like, how does okay. this work with this? Oh, yeah. Because it's like you, gotta, you guys got to play. Well, here's the thing. Uh, the song wasn't recorded to a click. Oh, man. And we rush and speed up and slow down. So they created a, a at least a follow click, not, not to a Did someone grit. tap uh, it sticks together or something? No, no, they, they, we, we somehow somebody went through and at least put a click so there was a, a even if it sped up, there was something like that. Yeah. And the lady who had done the string arrangement for on paper led the thing, listened to the click, and I think they did three takes, and what you hear is, because it took them a while to get it together to where they felt comfortable to go ahead and do takes. So I think the front half of the song is take one, and the back half of the song is take three, and they finished with two minutes to go on the clock. Did you feel that it was so, the song is so grand, and were you, you must have been psyched when you heard the, the strings along with the track, right? It was right? one of the greatest moments of my life because, you know, you dream it up, and somehow it worked. Like, you know what I mean? It sh shouldn't work, but it did. Um, because there's so many um, points of disaster. <laughs> Think about it, like, okay, you know, it's 2022, everybody works in Pro Tools, right? To do a song like that with no click. Oh my God. And then try to put a 30 piece orchestra on top of it. You would never do that. With Jimmy rushing fills and blah, do, do, and all this. I mean, and by the way, we didn't go back and move anything. So right. what you hear is them playing. Well, you couldn't the, do that, really. Well, we could have, but it would have sounded like it, shit. That's right. In early Pro Tools. Yeah. So it's a miracle that it, it, it turned out okay. 
it's kind of wild. Did you always play without a click on most songs? Uh, it depends. Uh, Jimmy and I have different memories of like Siamese sessions about click, not click. Um, Jimmy's great click player now. Um, I don't know how he figured out. Back in the day, he really struggled with because he's such a field drummer. Mm -hmm. And part of our sound was to rush and pull back. Musicians who would come in and play with us would talk about it. I mean, Mike Garson, um, great pianist who you know, played with Bowie more than any other musician on the planet, used to say, you guys play seven and three quarters bars. Because <laughs> we'd always rush the end of a bar, you know what I mean? And we were like, yeah, that's what we do. And he was like, but it's so weird. And then after a while, he'd be like, it kind of makes sense what you guys do, but it's, it doesn't, it's not good time, you know? So um, it's hard to say. Um, Billy, when you hear Pro Tooled Records rock bands over mm -hmm. the last 15 years or so, it, yeah. does it sound weird to you? It does. Um, even at times I hear stuff that we did to a grid and it sounds weird to me. Um, Talk about that a little bit. Talk about making records pre-Pro Tools on tape. Mm. As my friends joke, before there were Pro Tools, there were pros. Like to, to, to get, to even get into a recording studio, you had to be a, a, have a certain proficiency. Yeah. I kind of look at it like the ship has sailed, right? Mm -hmm. We're forever now in the auto-tune, <laughs> Melodyne, grid, Pro Tools land. Mm -hmm. It will never go back. You can go back. Um, and Does it sound weird when you go back, you think, if you if you were to go back? Not you, but just in general. You I, think, think people... I, think, I think to answer your question faithfully, it's, it's hard to go back into that brain. In 92, when there was no... I mean, you could use a click, but you pretty much weren't gonna because it was just too laborious. Yeah. Um, it was better just to get a great take, right? And then play good stuff on top of it. Um, you were fully committed to that was what you had to do to achieve something. Subconsciously now, if you try to do that, you're thinking in the back of your mind, well, if I mess up, we can fix it and move it. And, and the minute you start moving, it's over. It's like, um, it's the filter on Instagram, right? The minute you use the filter, it's like, well, that looks better. <laughs> you know what I mean? You don't go back to the unfiltered picture. <laughs> so um, I think that's the difficulty. I think that, like our, our latest single, Beguiled, Mm -hmm. was done to a grid and I think it does benefit because there's something about just the slamming of the sort of the Teutonic beat um, but there are certainly songs like a Jelly Belly or Chair Brock that you could never in a million years play to a grid those leans are just you'd be hard pressed in modern life to get people to commit to that including producers engineers mixers even who get used to everything landing boom 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 they get used to it yeah. Now you come in and it's like, well, in bar 36, it doesn't quite line up and then it gets a little messy in the sub and I had to go in and carve out the frequency. They're not living in that world anymore. Does the audience expect it to be perfect even? Yes. That's, yes. Is, isn't that really I'm not here the to problem? Blame the, I'm not here to blame the audience. I've moved on from that part no, of but my they, life. No, but they, they, I think it's subconscious though, don't you? That, that they, um, that, that things that are, Rhythmically, you know, gridded but and don't auto tuned, just, but also tuning now. Yeah, don't forget to. Yeah, the auto tuning that they expect that when they don't hear that, it doesn't sound right to them. Yes. So, um, not to throw Howard Willing, my my friend and co-producer and engineer, who's in the other room, um, he says he can't listen to certain old bands that are Hall of Fame bands because their vocals sound out of tune, mm -hmm. and. Were they out of tune in 1966? Not really, but to 2022 standards, yeah, they're out of tune. You're still hearing the record. It's a weird conversation, right? By and large, 99% of the time, do not use auto-tune. I'm more of a, I'll sing it more and we'll find good vocals. So we don't usually use that as part of our process. Um, but I do feel that pressure of like, if something's a little flat or a little blue, it's like you kind of feel this like, it's like somebody in the room going, you know, you should, there's, and there's nobody in the room, right? It's just it's like a cultural expectation, right? It's like a, you know, that doesn't really fly anymore. That, and I'm, you know, I'm very slighty, you know, uh, like my my hero in that type of type of singing was Robin Zander, Cheap Trick, who, you know, and Rick wrote those great songs. You know, I want you want me, you know, like a lot of sliding. So when you're sliding like that, it would be impossible to auto tune that. Well, it'd be difficult. It would, it's funny to hear weird. it auto tuned. Some people have tried at times just to sort of show me what it would sound like. It's, it doesn't Jarring. sound. Like, it doesn't sound like me. My my old uh, friend who recently passed away, Bjorn Thursrud, who was another producer engineer that I work with. We were having an argument once about uh, singing in tune, mm -hmm. 
and I said, you know, I can sing in tune if you, if you want me to. And he said, okay, sing in tune. Because I was in choir, you know, I mean, I know how to sing in, more in tune, more in tune, not in tune, but in more in tune. And I came back in and I, we played the tape and I pointed at the speaker and I go, okay, it's in fucking tune. And he goes, yeah, but it sounds boring. <laughs> so now we started having an argument over what is good Billy Corgan sharp singing versus <laughs> bad Billy Corgan sharp. And we sort of landed on plus three to seven okay. Uh -huh. Past plus seven cents is bad. I'm a singer right now. Okay, now go in the booth and sing sharp, but not too sharp. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It's weird. Uh, does that sharpness, though, that gives it the edge, though, that's it, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, that's the secret. That's the secret sauce. I think it's the animation with the guitars. It creates a chorusing effect with the guitars. It makes the guitars sound like they're being chorused when I'm doing especially when I uh, uh, double, uh, double, double track my voice. Yeah. I was in the studio with Rick Rubin, and I double tracked my voice, and he was like, oh, my God, that sound. You know, Because it's like an Aussie thing. It's like certain people have a voice that really animates in a double track sense. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a Gaelic thing, but... Um, when you go back and listen, if you do go, or if you're, yeah. if you're listening to the radio, and one of your, if nobody listens to the radio, I guess. I do, actually. Uh, um, I okay, so if you listen to the radio and, and it, one of your old songs comes on, um, do you, uh, does it take you back to the recording at all, or have you forgotten everything that you... No, I, I usually, it takes me back to the room, for sure. Yeah. I have like those kind of... Like, Time travel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's wild. It's wow, and it's funny what you remember. Like, what's what's something that you would remember from a, from a song? Um, is it usually things that bother you, or is it just you just you get random? You just are put back. Okay, in the I'll, I'll give you a quick one that would only make sense on a show like yours because most people would not care about this type of information. Uh, as I've said publicly a few times, 1979 was the last song recorded for Melancholy. It was literally the last day of recording. Flood said either we record it tomorrow, it's off the record. Everybody felt like it could be a hit single, but we could never get it together. So the last day we did this Kraut Rock version, which is the version. Mm -hmm. And I think the next day, we added an extra day or something for me to do the vocal. Um, and I was struggling at that time to use headphones. So I sat in front of the board with an SM7 like this and just sang like this, and that's the vocal. So if I hear that, I can see me sitting there cold as I always am in a studio with the SM7 with the little foam thing. Did you even it. have a mic stand or are you just holding the holding the mic? No, it's on a stand. Okay. And um, I still have the mic. It's the Siamese Dream vocal mic. And so we use that mic and that's the sound. I just see me sitting there singing to the speakers, you know. Is that how you would typically do vocals early on? No, it was all over the place. Okay. Uh, f Butch would have had a conniption if I tried to do vocals with without headphones because it's the sonics and the phasing. Flood was totally unfazed by it. He was like, oh, I do it with Bono all the time. Don't worry about it. I'd rather have you sing comfortable and we'll deal with the sonic problems. So that was kind of a ad hoc depending on the song. I really struggled for years to find the right headphones. I, I, I actually, I can't, I, could, I would, I would go, I don't, I don't have an endorsement with these people, but I can't remember the headphones that I use. I, I, the headphones I use now, I, I'm in love. Which are what? I'll give you the name, but I can't remember. But they're 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 off the ear, yeah. And they let in sound a little bit. As soon as I got those, it was like magic. It was like all the problems I'd had through all the years with singing with headphones went away. It doesn't and, mean I'm magically a not pitchy singer. It just magically I can sing with headphones. And singing with headphones originally though it bothered you because you can't really hear yourself well unless you take an ear off or whatever, right? Uh, this is gonna sound weird to put, um, but I think uh, this is the forum for it. Um, I think I have such hyper accurate hearing that the proximity effect of close range headphones would give me inaccurate pitch readings. So I would sing inaccurately. And then I would go in the studio and be like, how can I be that off? You know what I mean? So it wasn't until I found those ones that are off the ears that something had changed the proximity effect. So literally I sing and I go in and it's like, that's what I remember what I just did. It was like a weird experience. It would be like I would sing and think like somebody had changed the pitch and they'd like, what am, I, I felt like I was going insane. And you got somebody like Butch going, well, you have to do it again. And like, oh God, I can't, I'm losing my mind, you know? Typically when you would do a vocals, would you, uh, would you sing verses first? Would you, would you break a song apart? Would you do full takes and then comp? No, I'm more of a comper piece at a time. I have done full takes and there is something to it. Um, I, I believe you should sing in sequence generally. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's a little bit different in the Pro Tool era where maybe you'll fly choruses and stuff, but I think there's something emotional about your voice getting more and more gruff, warmed up that you take, even if you're doing it throughout the song, right? Yes. So, 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 so the, there's the song an emotional, is a national, yeah. nat natural progression yeah. through it, the in vocal intensity. Trust me, I wish I could step up to the microphone like some of my friends and just sing a few takes and you comp those three takes together and there it is. I'm just not that type of singer. I wish a lot of my studio experiences would be a lot more pleasant without the torture of singing. So Billy, I want to play a couple things. Since sure. we talked about Jelly Belly, I want to listen to it with you. So this is, to me, a perfect riff song, a perfect up-tempo song. The vocal melody is so balanced. You change every phrase has a, has a, a beautiful beginning and end in the verse, and then you split into the, in the, the chorus melody and then with the harmony in the mm -hmm. second half. Like Everything about it is so perfect, plus it has this kind of wildness with all the, with the intro. <laughs> Talk about this, about making this. Yeah, I don't know, because it's hard to trace back down the rabbit hole of how we even got there. Um, when you hear it now, what do you think though? Is, is it fun to listen to? Oh yeah, um, it makes me very emotional. Um, I know we're talking about production and stuff, but my personal uh, reaction is, there was such optimism in the band at the time. We'd sort of broken through, and it was the most harmonious time in the band. Un until recently, it was the only other harmonious time in the band where everything was sort of clicking. And I think the writing and the, the, the music is a reflection of that sort of um, courage or, I don't know. I, I, I personally felt like I had people had my back or something that I could take chances. So it's this beautiful balance of like insanity, audaciousness, confidence, stupidity, irony. You know, that's, I think that when the band's its best, it's sort of a weird mix of things that sort of go together, but kind of do. So it makes me a bit sentimental because, you know, that band a year later or so disintegrated, you know. So it's, it's a bit of a lot of emotions. Um, mostly I feel proud that we were able to capture that because um, coming off of Siamese Dream, which was this beautiful kind of perfect thing, you know, we jumped down this rabbit hole with Flood where we made a very dark and crazy record and and a double album. And yeah. so people were constantly thinking we were insane, but somehow together we didn't feel crazy and that got across the line somehow. When I think about that particular record, when it came out, the, the um, recording quality of it, this the song, for example. The world is a vampire to drain. The drums sound so See massive. So clear, everything Hold about it. Well, you laugh when you hear how we record those and drums, but... Unless you want me to talk over the track. Huh? Tell me about it. Well, we had rented a warehouse space, like a factory warehouse type space, 7,000 square feet. And we set it up one room where we had a board in there and a table where we'd have food. There was a room that we'd track in, big high ceiling. Um, there was a, a, what do you call it, skylight that leaked when it rained on Jimmy. Um, but wood ceilings. That's always good. Very high though, very high wood ceilings, but like industrial carpet, brick walls, um, like it's at, uh, Triclops, mm -hmm. and um, it's amazing because you talk about the drums. That's the band playing at full volume with uh, 
monitors next to Jimmy, mm -hmm. bands at full volume, and that's the drum track. Now we, we wiped all the band playing and I went back and overdubbed everything, but that's the drums with the band playing at full volume, wow. full concert volume with a full PA. Wow. So how Flood got that, I, I couldn't tell you in a million years. The clarity of the drums, I can't even imagine that, that uh, that's amazing. The floor time is so present. If, like you, if, you, if we had just the drum tracks of that, You'd, you hear could everything. hear the band, you could hear the band wailing away, you know, not perfectly in tune and the whole thing. So how I was able to wipe that, put fresh music and vocals over that, and it sounds like that, I can tell you that's all Flood. And then Alan's mixing. Let's go back to Siamese Dream and Triclops. And mm -hmm. I'm, I live in Atlanta, and Triclops was, uh, uh, I thought that um, Triclops was a great, great studio. And, um, and about how you guys would set up recording then versus when you, you know, working with two different producers, with Butch and then working with Flood and Alan. Mm. Uh, what, what was the, the, what would the setup be like? Would the drums be isolated and, no. uh, well, like on this one, or would they never would be isolated? A Siamese, because uh, you were there, Jimmy played at the end of that long room. Uh, we, were at, we were at a little bit of a distance so that us playing along to Jimmy um, wouldn't, you wouldn't hear a clicking of our strings or whatever, or me singing scratch vocals. The, the cabinets would be in another room, but we would play face to face. And there were massive arguments with the band when somebody would mess up all these complicated arrangements because it would throw Jimmy off. And there was even points where Jimmy would throw them out of the room and it would just be in me and Jimmy tracking because Jimmy didn't want to be distracted. And so, but that's generally how we used to track, face to face. Now, um, I think we're, we don't need that face-to-face -face time. So like in here, Jimmy's drums are set up here and I'd just be in the other room talking and playing. Um, what's, what's something that you, uh, you mentioned that you have a pedal from, from back then? Mm. From, uh, Mark. Mark Richardson. Yeah, a great guy from Triclops um, came in one day and said, I got this uh, fuzz pedal. The fuzz was taken out of a lap steel. Try it. And it was this crazy high frequency, like a jet plane or something. And so if you listen to Siamese Dream, and in fact, it's probably on there too, on something like Jelly Belly. Um, sometimes you'll hear old Pumpkins music where all of a sudden it sounds like a jet plane comes roaring in, like this upper high tonality, that was Mark's pedal. And at the end of the session, I went to give him the pedal back and he goes, nah, man, you keep it. So, so, so Mark is a dear friend, was a dear friend mm -hmm. of mine and um, and one of my other friends, Dave Honorado, I showed you a picture mm. of that from uh, from that session. Yeah. You guys, you, Butch, and Dave jamming on We used to jam with Sabbath. Mark, too. With Mark? Yeah, yeah. Me, me, Mark, and Jimmy would jam and play Deep Purple and got a grand funk. I don't know what that And that would be, like. what, a way to just kind of blow off steam? Well, the sessions were so stressful. Right. And Mark was one of those kind of... Um, so it's, affable. It's, it, well, it's yes, but it's amazing when you look back in your life sometimes... There are people who kind of play the, not the fairy godmother, but the fairy godfather role. Like mm -hmm. they kind of seem to walk in the room at the right times and tell a joke or lend a pedal or, hey, try out the Mellotron, which ended up on the record, which I now have that Mellotron. Um, you look back and you don't realize how people, whether it's the hand of God or something, they just, they add something that's so magical, but you can't, you couldn't put your finger on it. Mark was one of those people. He just, he would lighten the the room, and and then he saw that Jimmy and I needed to play, so we would we would stay. Butch would go home, and we would stay for a couple hours and just jam on riffs and just play music and just talk about what was great about I don't know Ian Pace or something. You know, you just need those people. Mark, some Mark was like that. Uh, he's he was one of my dearest friends. So you know what I'm saying yes. personally is like. Sometimes you just need somebody who's not in your orbit, who's not on your weird death trip, right? who can say, hey, have some fun, lighten up, it's good, I like what you're doing. Or come in and say, I like what you guys are doing. Oh, Mark likes it, must be doing something good. A little bit of confidence, you know? That goes a long way, especially to a young musician. Sometimes you need, because um, we were very much, particularly with Butch, we were in that sort of paternalistic relationship. Butch was our first real producer. Mm -hmm. So Butch was like dad. Uh, and, you know, that's not a necessarily a fair role to put Butch in. We laugh about it now. 
but you know, we'd be like, oh, dad wants us to be in tune, you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, fucking dad wants us to be in tune, you know? So Would you refer to him as that? or No, just... no, of course not. But... Of course not. I'll tell you a quick funny story about Butch. So Butch, back in the day, he always wore a white T-shirt and a vest. And we were obsessed with the vest, you know what I mean? T-shirt and a vest. <laughs> and uh, so one day we were like, what's with the vest, you know? And he was like, well, you know, I'm a producer, you know, like, makes me seem more official. <laughs> like, but we don't care. He was like, yeah, but I need it. I, I need the vest. You know what I, mean? like, I need to feel like I'm this guy, you know? <laughs> uh, between the first and second record, you guys, did your relationship with Butch change at all? Because a lot happened between the first and second record. Well, I know you've had your uh, Nirvana uh, reminisce. I was at Smart Studios the day Butch got the Nirvana job for Nevermind. Mm -hmm. There was originally another producer that was supposed to be on the session with him. And when I said, why do they want you to work with this other producer? Well, they don't trust me. I'm too young. Kurt wants me, but they, they need the other producer to be an adult in the room. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing. That producer d dropped out, so then it became Butch's job. So we were uh, very close to Butch. Butch bangs off to go do what became Nevermind. Uh, as I've told this story a few times, we're sitting with him on a Wisconsin lake on July 4th, whatever the year would have been. He says, you want to hear the new Nirvana? He's got a boombox. He presses it, and it's teen spirit. And, um, you know, as the sun's going down on a beautiful Wisconsin summer day. Um, and I had two reactions. First of all, I was like, oh, he ripped off Boston. More than a feeling. Interesting. And then when the song kicked in, I looked at Butch, and I said, you ripped off my guitar song, motherfucker. <laughs> and he kind of was like, I guess I did. Because everything that he took into that was stuff I taught him. Butch didn't need me to teach him how to mic up a cabinet, but the way I would layer guitars, Butch was like, oh, I'll take that. So now, Nirvana's on the radio every 18 seconds. And of course, every time I hear the guitar, I'm like, oh, there's my guitar sound. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, Nirvana blows up big, Pearl Jam blows up big. And like I said, you know, when we talked... Uh, you know, we were under this tremendous pressure. So it was a bit of sibling rivalry, to use the term loosely, and our guy is now the number one rock producer in the world, literally overnight. We were with Butch the night he found out Nevermind went to number one. Mm -hmm. We were having an Italian dinner in Madison, Wisconsin. We literally toasted Butch Vig, congratulations, you're the number one producer in the world. If you go back a couple years, we met on a Wisconsin street He's Butch Vig, the nobody, and we're the Smashing Pumpkins, we're nobodies. So in that short time, we have a major label deal. We have the biggest selling independent album of all time. Now he's Butch Vig, the big rock producer. It was like, how do we navigate right. this new thing? I think the way we navigated it was we went and made Siamese Dream together. And I think, I'm trying to put this in a way that would translate in this context. I think Butch loves us and and loved us loves us and i think the way he repaid his love to us was i'm gonna make sure you guys get that opportunity i'm gonna go all the way it makes him emotional because i get it now in a way as an adult that i wouldn't have as a child i'm gonna give you everything i have including the gravitas of my buzz i'm gonna make sure that the pumpkins get across the line too and not turn you into nirvana. Let the pumpkins be the pumpkins. It's very emotional to me when I look back on it now because I realize he did us a good deed in that. Because I can't imagine who was blowing up his phone after that record. Oh, yeah. I mean, can you imagine who was calling? I mean, Everybody. not just grunge legends. Like, yeah. It would have been legends of the past because he figured out the magic formula because, you know... And, and it's, it was obvious then, and it's obvious now. Nevermind was a once-in-a-generational record. It was that record. It was Are You Experienced? It was like, hello, something is happening. And we don't know what it is, but we know it, things have changed. So I think Butch going into that bunker with us at Triclops and spending that five months of 
hair pulling, arguing, and making that crazy record um, was his way of showing fidelity to, to Pumpkins and in particular me. Because we had a very uh, strong symbiotic relationship as producers. You know, I influenced him, he definitely influenced me. Um, not everybody likes it when I talk about my influence in that particular way, but I'm a producer. I mean, why shouldn't I talk about it that way? If I was just the producer of the Smashing Pumpkins, nobody would have a problem with what I'm saying. It's not that I want to take credit. Um, Kurt was, you know, easily the most talented person in our in our class. It's, it's, it's not a problem for me to say that. But it was weird to be in a situation where your guy, your guy is now this other guy, and you're watching him navigate fame, money, pressure, and then trying to ameliorate that back into the pumpkins world, which was very specific. And we had a very specific relationship. And we weren't the, we weren't the type of band that was gonna act different because now it's Butch Vig. We didn't give a shit. We weren't gonna treat Butch any different because he was Butch Vig. Um, we were gonna still do what we were gonna do. Um, and then by extension, and not to overly belabor it, he and Jimmy had a very, and continue to have, Jimmy and Butch just worked together on something recently, so I think Butch's uh, side project thing he did. Jimmy and Butch have a very intense symbiotic relationship, probably even more intense than It's Butch a drum, and, drummer thing, maybe. Yes, it's a, right? definitely a drummer thing. Butch and I is more of a producer, visionary, mm -hmm. his version versus my version, but it's a good, it's a good combo. Um, and it and it and it went on to be important for both of us, but the thing between him and Jimmy is more like it's like brothers or something. They're 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 bound pretty tight. So let's play something off of uh, off of Sammy's dream here because um, before I lost my mind, I don't know, it's like BC and the AD. <laughs> The string arrangement's beautiful. The the melody is beautiful in this. The fact that there's this big space for the strings to have this whole other melody in there. Mm. Now, who did the string arrangement I for did, this? Yeah. It's it's uh, so right. <laughs> Thank you. See, that's another miracle because um, we mocked it up on a keyboard, you know, very poorly. Kind of had some of the motifs, and then uh, Eric Remschneider had played cello with the band from Chicago, and then a man's name, who's, uh, a, name uh, a man's name, uh, a, a man who played with Kansas. Uh, uh, oh yeah, um, he lived in Atlanta too, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, he came in, he played violin. Yeah. And so they came in, and we played him the demo. Well, we played him the backing track, and we played him the demo of the strings. And they're like, okay, what do you want us to play? They're like, where's the, where's the score? And we're like, but there isn't one. And they said, well, we just can't we just can't riff over the track. We need something to play. <laughs> so we literally piecemeal, I would say, okay, um, here uh, go 
da, 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 da. And they'd write it down and they would go out and demo it. And then the, and it would be the next couple of bars. And I go, um, try this. And, they, and I just wrote it piecemeal all the way across. We demoed the whole thing out. We listened to it and said, okay, that's it. And they went there and they sat there and they scored it all out and they triple tracked it. It's a miracle. It's unbelievable. I mean, it could have been a disaster because the song was built for the string part. Um, and somehow in that one day, that's it. Now, was that played to a click, you think? That was definitely played to a click. Yeah, because it's so tight. Yeah. You're, it's all downstrokes and everything, yeah, too, it's right? Yeah, du double-tracked acoustic. Uh, my ovation was my first real guitar. Really? I bought, yeah, I still have it. Um, I wrote the song on that guitar, so it was apropos. And then um, we added the bells were um, real. Um, Jimmy played those. There's a little bit of keyboard cheating in there for a couple. Of, I think the timpani is, is actually a keyboard sample. Okay. We got a real timpani. It sounded like crap. Right. So I literally, <laughs> I literally sat there with the keyboard. And so that's all fake. Um, yeah. Somehow it, and then you know, similar to what we were talking about, um, I could still see myself in that room. It was all the way in the back. We walked down this long hall, and there was the vocal booth, that SM7, same SM7. And I remember the one memory I had listening to the track was um, I did the vocal, comped it. At that point, um, Butch was was very picky about pitch and vocals, and and I'd taken over the good job. Like I got worse than him at some point. He would be he would <laughs> listen to a comp and go, "Oh, that's great," and I go, "No, it's bad." So I actually I did, I did that whole vocal, comped it, listened to it, and said it's not good enough, and went and re sang the whole thing again. Um, so that's that I remember that somehow listening also it was like it all came back. The emotion in your voice here mm. to me is really what makes the song. Mm. It's so present sounding. I believe everything that you're singing. Well, it's real. <laughs> that song in particular was definitely not an act. Another song that I have always just thought was just a, it's one of my favorite songs of yours and it's off of the um, of Melancholy. It's an honor for me to play so, your songs for you. I know that sounds very, very strange here. It's interesting to sit and listen to them in this context, you know what I mean? Now, that's a once again a perfect melody. But could who could ever pull that drum part off? Jimmy is really unique. Okay, well that 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 we didn't really argue. We weren't an arguing band about music. We argued about everything else. We didn't, never argued about music. But that was a tense thing because I could hear it in my head what I wanted, and Jimmy was not comfortable playing uh, that loosely. Uh huh. Um, and the way I was able to get him across the line was we all were fans of this, the famous Big Star record mm -hmm. that everybody was goofy for. Um, and there's some beautiful drumming. He plays these kind of big fills. Yeah. And I said to Jimmy, I want this thing. And he was like, oh, I don't want to do it. It does sound sloppy or something. And I was like, but it's like the Big Star thing. And I was able to get it, at least sell him on the idea that if he played what we call like a Big Star style fill. And once he got into it, then he kind of started owning it, and it's so beautiful. Um, wrote the song on the piano, so that's what's weird about that song, too. Because he brought that song up, actually, the other day here in the studio for something we were doing on a new album. And, and I had to remind him that I actually didn't write the song on the guitar. That I think the song benefits from the fact that it wasn't written on the guitar. You know, it's these long, held chords because I wrote it 
panda style. Ding, 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 ding. So it's okay. interesting to have a song that just jumps in with the vocal like that. It's so. I know I used to pay a lot of attention to the way the Beatles would arrange, and I noticed there were a lot of Beatles songs that started right on the vocal. So that's like gave me confidence. Like, well, if they did it, like it must work. Um, doesn't mean it does, but um, I couldn't tell you why. The song's kind of long. And sometimes we would make decisions like that, where it's like, we got to lose 20 seconds. And you just look and go. <laughs> Take it up the front. Well, yeah, you just literally go, because it might have had an intro in the beginning, you just literally go, well, that's got to go. And just, that's it, got to go. Because most of our arranging, we would arrange constantly up until the moment of recording. So there would be a debate, like, literally at the last second, like, we're recording, like, well, the song's too long. Okay, uh, chop that. Boom, just record. The th when, I come, when I talk about the melody, da da mm. End of phrase, leave space. I mean, it's it's such a natural melody. The shape mm. of it is it has a beautiful shape to it, yeah. and it just every note delivers in it. Well, I watch your show and and I see you break down people's songs and stuff. So I appreciate kind of what you're saying and maybe why you're asking. I, I you just hear it that way. I just hear it that way. Yeah, I, I don't. I, pretty much anyone I've ever talked to, they hear it. <laughs> they hear it that way. It's yeah. like I always say. Most of the people don't know what they're doing, but I know what they're doing, so I'm going to tell you what they're doing. Sure. And, and uh, well, the, but its shape is. But the reason I like your show is I learn something about how other people do stuff from you, and that's informative. But. Um, and it can inform, as a songwriter, it can inform your process because sometimes when you get stuck, sometimes it helps to think of like, well, what would John Lennon do here? What would Bob Marley do here? Like, sometimes it can just get you across a line to like try something that you're uncomfortable with or expand your languaging. But as far as the core of what I do, it's always a mystery to me. And um, the best way I could explain it to somebody is um, uh, I'm at home playing the piano and I'm singing a melody, and I'll sing a note, and, and I'll think, well, that's kind of a weird note. So I'll find the note on the piano, and there's even times where the melody is the, if I'm, if I'm playing an E major, the melody is an F. Like, it's, it's dissonant. Yeah. And I'll think, well, that's wrong. So I'll re-sing the melody correctly, and there's a little guy in my head that goes, no, that's, no, it's, you're, like, there's an argument in my brain, and I cannot not hear the melody that my brain is telling me to sing, so that's the melody. And if I sing, if I derivate from it, there's a voice in my head that says, no, no, that's the wrong melody. This is what I love about your melody writing, is that it's just, it has such a natural flow. It's not. It's not linear. It has a lot of jumps in it mm. and things like that. And you just hear it that way, though, right? You yeah. you you look for those things, and you know when the phrase but, is supposed well, to end. It's twofold. Uh, it's what I hear, like mm -hmm. this part of the computer, but it's also a felt emotional thing. Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain, other than, um, and you know, this. Uh, let's call this a common songwriter problem. You're playing something, and you go, mm, "This part's okay." You try something and you go, well, that's a little bit better, but maybe it's too weird or out of context for what I'm looking for. And then you're into the binary choice of like, well, I can go to the D, which is the, the fifth, or I can go to the F, which is the, the flatted seventh, right, off a G chord or something, right? And you sing the one way, and then you sing the other, and then you sit there and go, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Um, I think that's the moment that makes you a songwriter. You know what I mean? Because... The math of what you're doing isn't, you know, you're not, you're not probably doing better than Bach or Mozart. You know what I mean? We're talking about rock, rock and roll. There are moments of beautiful sophistication, but at the end of the day, we're still uh, stuck in Western modality. But this is actually a very sophisticated, to me, it's a very sophisticated melody. The shape, the, the melodic shape, well, well, the phrases. Not to praise myself, I don't disagree with you, but what I'm saying is... We're still within the context of Western choral system. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not into moving polyphony like Bach, where he's moving. Yeah, has counterpoint and. Yeah, I mean, you listen to some of the Bach harpsichord stuff, and it's like. Yeah. Compare that to a really good Beatles song. I mean, Bach's winning, sorry. You know, it's just the way it goes. Right. But we're listening to the Beatles for a reason. That's what I'm trying to say is 
there's the math of the music and then there's the emotional part. And I think the emotional part is the, is the delineating point for most songwriters. Anybody can do math is what I'm saying. It's the emotional sort of why I'm attracted to this as opposed to that, I couldn't tell you. Billy, can you show me how you play that on the guitar? If we're being purist, this is the original key. I feel that I more than See, like, because you were asking um, in another part of this interview about, so what it, I notice is like, it's the it's the uh, the seventh here. Yeah, the yes, money. And see, my normal instinct now would be to play it with the D added, but it's yes. actually it's more of the ninth. See. Yes. Just those subtle things, Billy. Though that's what makes it. To me, I think it also suggests to your ear. Mm -hmm to go for certain notes in the melody. Just let's talk about the chorus for mm -hmm. a second, how you have the, the phrase in the middle, the connector line. What's if you were to play the, 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 just play the chorus, because you have the, It's all things yep. surely have to end. And gray loves will one day have to part. Right here. I know that I Okay, so that, that, that can, that, that to me is like a connector line. It connects the two halves mm -hmm. of the chorus. Right. It's weird because I've worked with a lot of other songwriters um, and I get to see how they work. And I've certainly studied a lot of songwriters, particularly great songwriters of great accomplishment, whether it's Burt Bacharach or Gilberto, right? Like, yeah. like teach me, I wanna learn. Because to me, it's like a soup. Like it goes in there somehow and it comes back out. It might come back out in a flavor, a rhythm, a chord. But that's what I'm saying. The emotional quality, I think, is the, is this is, is let's call it the emotional personality. Mm -hmm. John Lennon is one of my favorite songwriters, and of course, that's not a mystery. But there's an emotional consistency in his writing. Absolutely. Even though stylistically, he's all over the place, and he's a huge thief. The Beatles were great thieves. But at the end of the day, what you're attracted to is the emotional personality of John Lennon. Um, and I think that, and those are the little secret sauce things. There's a great clip um, from around 1970, whatever, uh, of him lying in bed playing O Yoko. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those only moments in which you get to see John just as a pure songwriter, just playing the guitar, singing. It's not perfect, but you can see his process. There's stuff that John Lennon does that nobody ever taught John Lennon, and it's just, that's the difference. And um, you can, as a songwriter, I can take credit and ego, and it's mine, and. And I'm not sitting, I'm not trying to be, you know, it comes from above. All I'm telling you is it just, it just works somehow. And people are generally, not always, I wish they always were, attracted to it when it's good. Um, and I couldn't tell you why, because when I was 18, 19 writing songs, I thought my songs were terrible. And now I go back and listen and I hear the roots of that sophistication even then. And I had no musical training, zero. So nothing. Now, when I hear muzzle, mm. to me, that's like something you could sit down on a piano or acoustic guitar sure. and write. And take a song like Tonight, Tonight. Mm. Now, some of that I can say yes, but then you have your verse, the picking part in the verse, mm. right? Uh, but is that something that you think of as more of an electric song, or is it was that written on acoustic? Because I've heard you do it live as an acoustic song. It was song. definitely written acoustic, yeah. Okay, so yeah. F uh, for example, that particular one, the... Sure. the um, you talking about the whole thing or just the... the just kind of how you transition, how you would go from the verse to the chorus and how you came up with that. Originally, the song was like this. We used to just jam on this change. And it went nowhere. Um, 
and then eventually wound around to So when you hit the resolve. Okay, that. When you go to that transition chord, yes. the G suspended chord, yeah. right? Without that, it doesn't transition into the verse rate. That just adds that extra little tension there. If I just went. Um, <laughs> which is what most people would do. Yeah. It that sounds wrong to me. Right, it needs that. Well. You and I agree, but I'm saying is, <laughs> what I'm trying to say, and it sounds a bit weird because it's hard to explain, is it's like a sense for me where if I don't put something in there, there's some voice in my head saying, not good, not good, not good. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know how to explain what that voice is. Yeah. Like, like hey, dude, wrong. Don't do that. Billy, do is, that. is it something about that, that to be a great songwriter, you have to constantly be going back and saying, is this as good as it can be? Or... Is there a better way to do this, or what? It, there is some process. Mm -hmm. When I interview people, I, I these are the things. They just have a very self-critical. Um, all great songwriters, they they work on the things until they're right. Okay, I think that's a beautiful question. I'm going to try to answer it best I can. Um, uh, a songwriter starts with a blank piece of paper. Mentally, there's nothing. There's no sound. There's no chord. There's no key. Songwriter makes the decision. Okay, so let's use tonight tonight because we're talking about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I made the decision to change it from to this. So now we're in we're in G major here, but in the in the recording it's a half step down. Okay, so now we're now we're in G. I have an emotional map in my mind of what I'm looking to do. So I'm sitting on my bed and I'm futzing around with all sorts of ideas, figures. So I have a now the now the paper has a bunch of doodles on it. At some point I have to make a I have to make a decision. How, do, how does this song start? So we started with, because I want an orchestral flair. What's interesting is we'll play this song live and most people don't react off of that. They don't recognize the song until we get to, which is weird, right? Because I would think you'd hear, oh, they're playing tonight, tonight. <laughs> Nothing, crickets. It's funny, right? I can't even imagine how they could right. not. That's ridiculous. And we have this interesting figure, right? Where we do this. Carry the figure. Beautiful. But it's weird, right? Yeah. Oh, it's so right. But once you hear that, I can't unhear that, right? So right. that becomes, that's the part. Yeah. How we're going to execute it in the recording medium is different, but that's the part. Yeah. There's an acoustic demo of me playing it with a bunch of reverb on. I'm not, I haven't changed it in 28 years. That's how you play the song. There's no other version. So you make that level of commitment. So to answer your question, once I arrange the song and I've got all these parts and figures and these little doodads, let's call it like an, a, a template map. Mm -hmm. When I play the song and I sing the song, even with blah, blah lyrics, the entire time I'm thinking, is this what I want? Is this what I want? Is this the movie that I'm trying to make? Am I, am I not saying something that I need to say? Am I saying something that I don't need to say that's so fucking obvious that's for the punters to do? It's like a constant argument of aesthetics, a messaging, um, personality, ego. You know, is this original? Is it okay if it's derivative? Um, a lot of times when we do derivative stuff, we'll put in little stuff that only somebody would pay, be paying attention to would go. They're, they're actually acknowledging that they're ripping off the Everly Brothers. They're doing a little wink and a nod. The Beatles did it, we do it, Cheap Trick did it. It's something we, we don't mind doing. It's a conversation, but it would be the, the emotional equivalent of, if you and I sat down and talked about the World Cup, when is the conversation over? When I've said everything I wanna say and you've responded and we go, okay, that's it, we're done. Five minutes or an hour. A song in four minutes has to crystallize everything I wanna say, and so, the arrangement, everything is like, is it saying what you want to say? Is it communicating? And I don't know how to express that other than the little voice in my head says, no, yes, no, yes, yes, no, no, and gets constant. It's constant. It's like, it's exhausting. Does it go on for days sometimes? Months. Months, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. When you play that, though, I hear the orchestra right there when you go b between those, those two, just those, those four different chords there. Yeah. It suggests the entire or orchestral part. Yeah, well, that was 
that's how I wound around to playing it that way was like I would hear the orchestra playing in my head. Okay, mm -hmm. well, you sit, then you sit down with the producer, Flood, in this case. Hey, I want an orchestra. Okay, what's it going to play? I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. That's where it gets problematic. Um, but it was written with the orchestra in the back of my head. So same thing, right? As I'm playing, I'm, I'm hearing the fake magical orchestra in my mind and thinking, is this what I want? Is this what I want? Is there a better version? And we would practice the song in this arrangement. I would say to the band, we're the who, and then there's going to be an orchestra go over the top. So we got to worry about getting the who part right. So all the fills, Jimmy, everything is all about that. Quick story. Uh, we recorded Tonight Tonight at night, which was very unusual. We did most of our tracking during the day. And for whatever reason, we were having a night session. We did one take of the song. We did the second take. I looked at Jimmy, looked at me, went with, that's it. Flood came out from the other room and he goes, There's, you got to do more takes. And we said, that's the take. It's totally not perfect. But somehow we were like, that's the take. And we're, that's not normally how we work. So the same thing, emotional narrative, right? Is that version, the way Jimmy played, the way you lean into this chord, is it saying what you want to say? It's like the building blocks. And you trust every part of the process that somehow it's all going to add up. But that's the mystery part, I couldn't tell you. Because you could sit here and say, well, tonight, tonight, it worked beautifully and it was a big hit song. Well, I've done it on 50 other songs and nobody gives a shit about those songs. So I can't sit here and say it's a magical, foolproof process. But it has worked more often than not. And that's where you get into like percentage of like uh, major league hitters, you know. If you if you get a hit every three out of three out of every ten at bats, you're a Hall of Famer, right? That's amazing, actually, when you think about it, right? Mm. That three out of ten for for in baseball is Hall of Fame. Well, I've written four hundred songs, and probably thirty to forty are widely known, maybe fifty. So my percentages are good. You look at the Beatles. The Beatles, I think, released one hundred and eighty or two hundred songs, and the world knows a lot of them. When you look at today's music, mm -hmm. okay, and, and I don't, I, I don't like to necessarily ask people this uh, that are, you know, I'm older than you, Billy. I'm sixty. You're fifty-five. But you're 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 young, you're young sixty, Rick. But um, and you see things like TikTok and mm -hmm. and uh, I wouldn't say YouTube. YouTube is different because YouTube I I think of as as a learning platform or an entertainment platform. Uh, but you see things like TikTok that drive the music business now. Does it seem just completely weird to you? No. I think kids are always going to gravitate towards excitement and you can't sort of um, look askance at kids for doing what's exciting to them. Mm -hmm. They're you know, I have young kids, four and seven. I know you have young kids. What attracts them in a dopamine-rich society? Um, you know, are they going to feel the same way that somebody felt watching Ed Sullivan in 1966? They're just not going to. So it's always the music businesses uh, or the artists, by extension. They have to figure it out. Um, you could certainly make an argument that musical language has devolved in the last 10 to 15 years commensurate to technology, but um, that's what geniuses are for. The next genius will come along and somehow f figure all that out and put it together and become the Mozart of TikTok or the Kurt Cobain <laughs> of Instagram or something. They just will. Aren't you glad, though, that your career began pre, really kind of pre-internet, pre-social media, pre-cell phone? Doesn't it I don't know. I think we would. I honestly, this is a weird way to put it. I think I think the band would be bigger and young now than we were back in the day. I think we were we were a perfect band for social media. In fact, I think we were doing social media before there was social media, because we would cause fake controversies and we would pretend argue with each other in public and on MTV. We would do all sorts of weird stunts and <laughs> very meta in in today's mm -hmm. landscape. And. Um, the band was very visually rich and four distinct personalities, strong, strong personalities. I think the band would have done quite well. You had a lot. You had a lot of great controversy that, that, oh, that yeah. happened, and, and we, uh, but we also courted it, which was part of our. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds glib, but part of our business model because we figured out very early on that the critics didn't necessarily like us. So, if we weren't going to get good press, we had to create our own press. And this is all pre-internet. Now that sounds very trite, but pre-internet. 
it was very unusual to do that, mm -hmm. to create kind of controversy by using yourself as the test dummy in the controversy. That was very unusual. Um, and if we ever make a documentary, I think the documentary will get into that in a way that would surprise people because, you know, I work in professional wrestling, as some people know. Um, that's very professional wrestling, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, um, if we were working professional wrestling, I would insult you. Or, You'd body slam me right now. No, I would, I, would, <laughs> I would do something that would make you uncomfortable that would create something that people would want to watch. Mm -hmm. Instead of us having a nice conversation about music and sevenths chords, you know, I would, I would say, well, you know, and I saw this episode you did, Rick, where you did this, and I didn't really <laughs> like it. And that's, that's the modern world, right? So I, I don't blame kids for leaning into the modern world. Um, I think it's a shame, though, that, um, how can I put it? When I was a kid, I went to the Dolly Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I was surprised that Dolly could actually paint. Because my impression of Dolly as a outsider type of artist was he was more of an innovator and a showman. And, but I was surprised that Dolly could actually paint like a normal person. And I use that word normal loosely. I think what's important about a show like yours is if you want to be a musician, you still have to have chops. You still have to be able to execute at a very high level in whatever your medium is because the chops will definitely come into play. The people, if you go to a Broadway show, that person's danced for 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. Even if it looks like they're doing it like it's nothing. I still think you have to have that. I don't think there's anything wrong with kids going to School of Rock and learning how to play like Angus Young. It's all good. I still think that's important. Well, I always say that uh, instruments don't play themselves. Well, you these days, they, in... <laughs> once, but look, we're, we're, we're on the verge of AI systems that will literally make learning how to play an instrument completely redundant. Maybe. I'm, I know we're on the verge I'm, of it. I'm going to uh, bet you on that. But uh, I bet well, in 20 years there will be artists who figure out how to use AI systems to game some type of keyboard that will intuitively understand what they're trying to do and do all the all the heavy lifting. Well, that will be I, that's going to be in the next three years. That's my prediction with that. But what I'm saying is, my argument would be whether it's ten years or twenty, it will be prevalent. AI systems will completely dominate music. The idea of an intuitive artist beating an AI system is going to be very very difficult because the punters will come along because they're photogenic or because they're sociopaths which, you know, the music business loves sociopaths, and will reward somebody who figures out how to game some intuitive AI system that if they play three notes into it, it'll write their songs for them, and as long as they rap or sing over it halfway decently and somebody can auto-tune it in a basement somewhere, <laughs> and they'll go from obscurity to making a million dollars a year, they're not going to argue about the fact that they can't play a keyboard or never learn the difference between a seventh and a ninth chord or whether or not Kevin Shields was an innovator. They're just going to blow past all of that. It won't matter to them. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I do think that something will be lost because the things we've talked about here and the things you often talk about on your show involve a deeply emotional, intuitive process that takes time. It takes time. It's, it's, it's an exploration of self. Jimmy Chamberlain, my, my brother in the band, whose drums are right here, He's playing at a level right now which is insane. And we've spent most of our time talking about stuff Jimmy and I did over 25 years ago. Jimmy Chamberlain right now is playing at a level that is almost beyond my comprehension. And, I, and no one's played more with Jimmy Chamberlain than I. To watch him as a musician, as a father, as a friend, go through that deeply emotional process of learning, recommitting, bringing new things to the table, he plays a lot of jazz. That's influences his drumming. No way I saw Ice System will ever trump that journey. Absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. Billy, I really appreciate you spending this time with me. This has been incredibly insightful. Thank you. And uh, I've just, uh, you know, been such a fan of yours for over 30 years now. And thanks, thanks for doing this. It all started with Ingve. <laughs> I just wanted to be a guitar player. I really did. Appreciate it. Thank you.